So feel free to fill that out while we're getting started. And also, if you wouldn't mind in the chat box, putting your name as well as where you're from, like what coalition you're involved with. We'd love to, to know who's on the phone. So go ahead and answer the poll while we get started. If you're just logging in, we're about to get started in just a few minutes. If you wouldn't mind answering this poll question while we get started, which of the nine habits do you think that your coalition might need some work in? So we just thought we'd take a moment to see, take a pulse of the room. Um, don't forget to scroll down. There's nine habits, so you can scroll down and, and choose from all nine. You can choose uh, more than one. And if you also wouldn't mind putting your name and where you're from, what coalition you're associated with, in the chat box, that would be great. That way um, we'll know all the different folks that are on the line. Looks like it's 401, Karen and Leslie. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and get us started. We'll keep the poll up, Todd, while we're while we're getting chatting, chatting and I'm introducing our speakers. But my name is Katie Beachy and I'm from the American Cancer Society. I work in the, the comprehensive cancer control team here, which basically means um, I have a really fun job. I help provide technical assistance and training opportunities to you all out there in the field who are working on the front lines with cancer coalitions around the country. And we're glad you're here. One of the things we do here at ACS is host informational webinars. Some of you have been on um, some of the five webinars we've had since this summer. Today we have a super special opportunity and it's a little bit different than the webinars we've had so far this fall in that it is coalition focused. While our webinars topically are sometimes cancer site focused or have some um, very sp specific cancer continuum focus, today we're just going to talk about coalition health um, because you need coalition health in order to address all the things that we've been talking about on those other webinars. It's a, it's a critical um, aspect of life in cancer control. And we're fortunate to have um, Karen Holman and Leslie Given with, with us today from Strategic Health Concepts. Those of you that have been in the cancer control community for the past few years have probably met Karen and Leslie or seen them at conferences. They are literally the backbone of comprehensive cancer control and we're integral in getting the whole concept of comprehensive cancer control programs, um, something that was an infrastructure nationally. So um, they have a consulting firm, then they're happy to come to your state and help you work through your strategic planning as you look at your cancer control plans or just help you figure out and troubleshoot what's going on with the dynamics in your coalition. And I've had the benefit of knowing them for over a decade now in my work as program director in Kentucky and now at ACS. So um, Karen and Leslie, we're thrilled that you're here. Um, feel free to share more about yourselves, but we're really excited to hear about the update for the Nine Habits Guide that's been a blueprint for us for many years. And um, thank you for being here. So I'll hand it over to you, Karen. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and hi, everybody. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Katie. Um, nothing else to say about us because we really want to just dive into the meat of our webinar. A um, couple things that I would um, mention is if you have questions at all as we're going along, uh, please type them in the chat box and um, you can on your on your screen, you can go down and see um, where it says chat and you can click on that and your chat box will come up. Um, also, um, we have a couple people that are actually on uh, line today and we're going to be having some 
um, examples from folks that are actually online, but um, we've got recordings. And so um, those folks that are online, thank you for <laughs> volunteering your, um, your examples. And what this really, what we want this webinar to be is very interactive and um, lots of questions. You actually are the experts in this. Um, you all have been living and breathing coalitions for a long time. So the nine habits really came from um, what Leslie and I and ACS and CDC have all seen throughout several years. Um, and I think the best thing to do is start, remember why we want a coalition. Why do we even have a coalition? And, and part of that, if you, you, know, you recall, is just we are stronger together. One voice is more powerful um, to come together as one voice. Um, we um, leverage strengths and pool resources. Um, it's really building a community of people and organizations that are working towards a common goal. So all that sounds really, really wonderful, right? Then why is it sometimes so hard? And some of the reasons why I'm sure you all um, have experienced is that in this situation, the coalitions that we're talking about, the cancer copyrights of cancer coalitions are volunteers. And everyone, typically, most everyone has another day job. And so when you're um, working with volunteers, it's hard to sometimes put much pressure on them because they do have other obligations in, other, um, in, their, in their other jobs. Um, we have lots of personalities. We always talk about getting a very wide and diverse stakeholder group. And there are a lot of diverse personalities. And so a lot of times when you bring those diverse personalities together, um, it, can, it can cause or have, be some challenges. Um, lots of people have different ways of working together, different ways of leading. Um, in our uh, cancer coalitions, often there's limited resources. And, um, and there's varying levels of seniority and expertise when we bring people around the table. And I think the biggest thing too is that we're really trying to address a very complex problem. And there's many w different ways that we can um, address those problems. And, and, but none of them are that easy. And so this is really where um, the nine habits came from, is really trying to figure out what are the common issues and what are some solutions that we're seeing and that we're hearing um, from folks about um, what works for them. So coalition challenges, hopefully some of these, or maybe some of these sound um, similar to you all. Um, uh, same people, same few people do all the work. It's kind of that 80-20 rule. It seems like um, just a handful of people are the ones that always show up and the ones that always volunteer. Often we start something and then lose momentum. People get really kind of gung-ho at the beginning and then things start to kind of peter out. And why is that? And why can we, or how can we um, address some of those issues? And then, and then people kind of really feeling like, is this a value, um, or do they value my time? And is this something that I should spend my valuable time on? And is my contribution really making a difference? Um, anything else that you guys would put in the chat box um, as far as other issues that you've encountered in your coalition? I'm sure some of these probably sound the same, but are there other things that you might um, want to share with the group? I'll give you a second here. You know, Karen, in the, on the um, poll, it looks like clear goals and accountability is one of the major things. Um, yeah. which I think we would agree seems to be the major thing. So in the chat box, you know, what's your specific um, uh, challenge around that? Um, or what is the thing that you're trying to solve? That might be helpful for us to see and everybody else as we go along. Yeah, so I see some things like not enough representation from the community. So getting that diverse stakeholder input and getting people to come. Um, we also see accountability as being an issue. Yeah, Karen and Leslie, this is Katie. Someone um, messaged me and said just having like defined and on, as far as accountability, like a defined roles, like the health department does this, the American Cancer Society does this, uh, the, the health systems do this, like having very clear roles. And then how do you hold each other accountable when you're, a lot of these organizations are volunteer? 
Exactly. So, so good. Those are um, good challenges because that is really what the nine habits are all about is, is um, looking at those challenges and then trying to figure out what are the habits. And we have here, um, what the habits are is that we thought this was a great, uh, great, great quote. Um, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. So if something is done over and over and over again and is embedded in for this in this example the coalition's operations it ends up being a habit and that's what the coalitions are all about they're the coalition nine habits so here they are a list and as you look at the poll results it's interesting to see that um, as leslie mentioned habit number seven clear roles and accountability uh, is is leading the pack but certainly everybody is voting on at least one of these habits and they all are showing up um, as, as challenges. And so we're gonna touch on um, some of these today in a little bit more detail than others, but the nine habits uh, um, include the powering leadership. So um, looking at the leadership and looking at things like succession planning and how leaders make um, uh, decisions. Also shared decision-making within the coalition structure is another one of the habits. Value-added collaboration. Uh, we talk about this a lot. This is really asking the coalition, what can we do together that wouldn't happen unless we worked on it together? So we're not trying to duplicate anybody else's um, agenda or mission or um, organizational purpose. It's really bringing those diverse stakeholders together and saying, what wouldn't happen unless we worked on this? Dedicated staffs, people, and this is kind of goes into the roles and accountability too, because dedicated staff needs to, there needs to be people that are dedicated to getting some of the work of the coalition done. Because it is a volunteer organization or, or um, uh, partnership that um, there has to be some people that are uh, designated with fulfilling some of the tasks of the organization. Diversified resources. Um, we talk about this a lot as far as uh, not putting all of your eggs in one basket. Um, and so making sure that if something goes away or something gets lessened, um, that there are other resources that you can pull upon. Effective communication, you know, coalitions are really, a, uh, really about relationships. And so effective communication is so critically important. And there's some very clear, easy ways that you can improve and make sure that your communication is, um, is effective and efficient and getting to the people it needs to be um, gotten to. Clear roles and accountability. This is a big one that we talk about a lot of times with different coalitions. Having a conversation about who is doing what, by when is so critically critically important, and um, and all of these all of these uh, habits kind of blend into each other. But I would say, even as you have all indicated here, clear rules and accountability is probably the one thing. If you don't have that right, it can affect a lot of these other habits. Flexible structure. This actually came um, not as um, as much of an issue in the poll. Um, and that's good. I think that people are being pretty flexible with, with how their work groups are structured, um, how their leadership is structured, how you get things done when you have meetings. So that's, that's really good. And I think people should feel very, um, uh, feel like they can be flexible in their, in their uh, coalition. And then setting and implementing priorities. Again, this is a big one. Being able to have a focus of the coalition. As we all know, the cancer plans are very big, have lots of goals and objectives and strategies. And unless the coalition can focus in on a handful and say, this is what we're gonna work on this year, um, then that focus kind of goes all over the place. And so, um, and so setting and implementing role, uh, priorities is just um, something that will make you be much more successful as a coalition. Okay, so before you begin, um, working on the nine habits and Leslie's going to talk a little bit later about um, ways to use the nine habits in your coalition. But before you even start on the nine habits, you really need to have leadership involvement and saying, you know what, we want to look at these nine habits and figure out ways that we can actually incorporate them into the operating guidelines or principles of our coalitions. And then to encourage other members to value them well. So this is again part of that communication, talking about what the nine habits are, 
communicating them to other members um, and having a discussion around them. And then again, make habits a way of doing business in the coalition. Having things written down, whether it be forms or whether it be in bylaws or whether it be in operational guidelines, having things written down so when people do leave, as they do, come and go, that this isn't just, this is um, not how we used to do it when so-and-so was around, but this is how the coalition operates. And so um, in order to make that happen, to make it more formalized, you need to write these things down. So we've got some um, guest speakers and how we're doing guest speakers today is that we've got pre-recording um, and I'm going to stop sharing that. Okay. Whoop. I don't know if I can get rid of that, Todd, or if I, anyways, I don't know if everybody's seen that poll anymore, but I still am. But we have three um, guest speakers that did some pre-recordings for us and I think that listening to them about some of the specific habits and how they've addressed them in their, uh, in their coalitions is really, um, really useful and really helpful. So we, our first person is Shantae Davis from um, California, and she's gonna talk here about using the nine habits during strategic planning. So I'm gonna play her, uh, her sound bite here. All right, thank you so much, Shantae Davis, for joining Today to chat about the nine habits, your vision, and how you needed to use the guide in your work. Shanti's from California and has been a longtime program director with the program there. And Shanti, you had mentioned that you're thinking about using this guide in some future meetings with your coalition. Could you talk a little bit about that? Our coalition is in the process of planning a restructure and doing some strategic planning in um, conjunction with the revision of our cancer plan, which will eventually be the implementation of our cancer plan. So we'll be having a face bringing all of our coalition members that are a part of our steering committee together in a face to face meeting sometime next spring. and. Before that meeting, we'll be utilizing the nine habits so we can really focus on specific habits that are identified after we do the assessment. Awesome. So do you envision yourself picking a habit, let's say, and passing out some worksheets to go through it together with the steering committee? Yes. What we are planning to do is put the, each one of these habits all of the questions that are included in the guide in a survey. So we'll have our coalition steering committee answer the questions that are included in the guide through a survey that we create on one of our survey platforms. And then we'll look at those results over the next two or three months or so and determine which habit we really need to focus on and then bring those results to our face-to-face -face planning meeting that we're going to have. That's awesome. I'm not sure if we got cut off there. I'm not sure that, let's see. You can keep going. Um, did it, I think it ended. Yeah, that was the, I think that was the end of it. You okay, good, it just automatically stopped, so yeah. all right. It's All so right. fun to hear Shante's voice. I don't know if she's on the call, but <laughs> yeah, Shante, thank you for for that. And and something that Leslie's going to talk about a little bit more later is actually the structure of the guide. But what Shante was talking about is that in each of the habits in the guide, there is a self assessment form, and it talks about um, uh, it asks questions about how are you doing this in your coalition? Is this working in your coalition? So it's a really nice way of being able to ask questions, the coalition members answer these questions, and when she was saying that we're gonna figure out which habits we're really struggling with, that they were gonna do all those nine habits and then, and then figure out which ones to focus on. So um, that guide has self-assessment questions, and then also when you do focus on a habit, then it's got some tips and tricks and, and forms in there for you to, um, to um, try to make that habit uh, part of your coalition. So I'm looking, um, and any thoughts about uh, what Shante talked about and, and using the nine habits in a way for strategic planning? Has anybody done something like that? Yeah, and feel free folks to come off mute or um, yeah. start your video, anyone's welcome. Yeah, please.
Anybody used, um, has anybody used the nine habits? <laughs> Hi, this is Lauren with the West Virginia Cancer Coalition. Hey. And um, thanks for having us today. Um, we worked on habit one at our last face-to-face -face meeting and it, I think it really brought the group together. Um, it let them kind of express their opinions in a positive manner instead of, you know, sometimes when we get to talking about things, you end up complaining about things. And I think this was really a positive way to move forward um, we got some really good feedback and actually we ran over in our meeting and um, we're gonna touch base on the last page there of um, habit one and then we're gonna work on two and three in January. So yeah, this was really positive for West Virginia's steering committee. Well, thanks, that's, that's great to hear. And you know, one of the things that we've heard is just what you said, it's just a way to start a discussion. You know, as we know, there's no, right way or wrong way to do this, but to start having these discussions about um, what's working, what's not, and how to do things better. And these questions really initiate that discussion and it sounds like that worked for you guys. So I'm glad to hear that. Hey, this is Tennessee. So we actually have an outside um, evaluator with Vanderbilt who's conducting a, a nine habit survey. So it'll be anonymous through our members. Um, we have a list of over 300 members across the state. We have seven different regional coalitions. So we have quite a few people on the list. It's going to help us um, clean the list up a little bit, but then also give us um, areas that we, we need to focus on a little bit more. And then they're also doing qualitative interviews with 20 identified uh, people who have been with the coalition for a while. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, I think we'll get our results in the end of March. So we'll see, we'll see what comes of it. Great, thank you for sharing. So yeah, there are different ways to use this. I mean, a survey like you guys are doing or a discussion item on an agenda during a meeting, um, many different ways that you can do this and also, um, one of the things that we recommend is not just, you know, hitting all nine habits at one is trying to figure out what to focus on first. Like Shante just mentioned, and like our other two folks just mentioned just now is um, trying to figure out what the focus should be or, uh, or addressing one at a time, um, one, one habit at a time. I'm looking at, so Deidre um, with SPIPA, our committee worked on habit nine only able to get through half of it. But yeah, it develops context. And so habit nine is, um, for those that you don't have the habits memorized, are um, set, identifying and setting priorities. And so again, that is um, such an important thing to focus your, your, uh, your coalition's efforts on. And you know, it doesn't have to be one priority in that. Again, this is something that you have to have a conversation with, with your coalition. How many priorities can you actually tackle at one time? What's your capacity? What are your resources? Some coalitions have one, two, three. Some coalitions have five or more. Yeah. So again, it's a conversation that you have with your coalition about what are our priorities? How many can we address? Um, and what's the time frame for them? Karen, can I ask you a mostly question kind of based on something that Christina just said? She mentioned that they were going to do a survey, create the, make the self-assessments into a survey that would be anonymous. And so it seems like you could use the questions and whatever would work for your coalition, right? Like if you want people to be completely transparent, because <laughs> some of the answers to those questions might be really hard for folks to hear if they've been mm -hmm. working in the coalition for a long time. Do you talk, I mean, have you seen it done both ways where people say answer and don't tell us, or let's sit and stare at each other and answer these together? Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, and, and you're right, some of these get to hard issues in the coalition. And again, it's a way to be able to bring up some of those hard issues that um, typically are, are kind of skirted around. One thing that we've seen folks um, do and that we actually recommend is that 
Um, for those that haven't seen it, and I see that there's some questions about the discussion questions or the self-assessment questions, they're usually, they're all, I think, on one page. And so sometimes, like in a coalition meeting or in a leadership group, which is a little bit more intimate, which sometimes works a little bit better, is that you have everybody answer those questions um, on their own first. And so they do a self, truly a self-assessment about what they think about how the coalition is doing. And then to come together and say, okay, well, how did we rate ourselves on this question? And if it's very consistent, everybody rates yourself really high, then you can say, okay, well then let's move on. But if there's all over the place, um, you might find then that's the part of the conversation. Well, I thought we were doing really well here. Well, I don't think we're doing so well. And why is that? And having that conversation. This is really about though the coalition is looking at itself as a whole. So it's really should not be about individuals not doing well, but, but identifying the issues that the group can talk about and the group can say, how can our coalition as a group do better? That's a good distinction, Karen, because I think that we can get lost in our own egos <laughs> sometimes, yeah. even, even in coalition work, so yeah. Yeah, so I think some people have you have turned the the sir the um, self assessments or assessments into surveys and done them anonymously, you know, up up front just to get a sense. Especially if it's for the whole coalition, if you're trying to do it just for a small group I think we lost people, I'm not sure. I'm not sure anonymous is good, but for the whole coalition you can use it that way i think and do a survey but to take the results and then discuss them is is um is important to do yeah okay well i'm going to move us along but this is great thank you so much um for sharing your examples and asking your questions i really appreciate it so we'll go to the next example which is christy cahill from colorado and Christy's going to talk about um, diversified resources and how they have dealt with that in their coalition in Colorado. So let's listen to Christy. Karen, we can't hear that at all, I don't think. Uh, there we go. If you could turn it up a little, Karen, that'd be great. How it related to diversity and how hard it can be for comprehensive cancer control coalitions to find funding that they need to do what they want to do and implementation of their plan. So what did you achieve or what were you able to change about your coalition by working on diversifying your coalition? And how did you how did you go about trying to diversify? Yeah, so every seems like every coalition struggles with the can we fund our cancer plan and so we had a group of dedicated volunteers who had some policy connections and they were able to get the Colorado Cancer Coalition onto the voluntary contribution form and what that allowed us to do was that when people filled in their state taxes they could choose to donate to the Colorado Cancer Coalition and so then we put in place a process um, that a board would review grants that come in that align with cancer plan goals. And they would then grant out the money across the state to different programs that would help implement cancer plan priorities. And that definitely helped create a intentional pot of money that could go towards cancer plan implementation. That's great. And I have a question that I thought of, um, Christy, related to that. How, if it was your volunteers in your coalition that were able to move this forward, that meant you had buy-in and there wasn't a sense of competition in the, you know, saying, well, we're going to put Colorado Cancer Coalition on this checkoff form. How did you, that must have been a, some universal buy-in, like some goodwill that already existed. If we take a step back, it actually was the Colorado Breast and Reproductive Cancer Fund. So we had buy-in at first from those two cancers per se. Um, and then two years after that, we got even more buy-in to broaden it to all cancers um, because everyone saw the value in just opening that to, to more than just the breast and reproductive. That's a great thing to know actually that you had you had something that was already there and you were able to get other coalition members to, to 
those people, the breast and cervical people, and the other people to say, let's widen this so that it's not just a one, one cancer track. Yes, yeah, it, you know, it definitely took a lot of conversations to make sure, you know, breast and cervical wouldn't lose everything and to broaden it. But at the same time, we also took our breast cancer resource directory and turned it into the all cancer resource directory. So we're really trying to elevate all the other cancer types as well. That's good. And kind of make it a win-win for them as well, that they could be a part of that. That's great. Well, as you thought about um, this habit and what it looked like to implement it for Colorado's Cancer Coalition, what would you say to another cancer coalition somewhere in the country who wants to work on this and how they could go about implementing what you've done? So first I would look at what the voluntary contribution process is in your state to see how organizations can get listed there. And then depending on what that says, find your policy or legislative champions who can help help you figure out how to get your organization listed listed on there. And then once you're on there, then you get the fun, the fun task of marketing. And so getting really creative about how you do market it. We use social media, Facebook and Twitter and a little bit of Instagram. And then we also use a local ad agency to do some print locally in the metro area. We haven't done print outside of the metro area yet, but we're hoping the social media reaches those avenues. And then the other really creative angle that we use is for organizations that are grantees, we require them to help us market the fund. So then the next cycle, they're helping us push out on social media about the fund so that we can bring in more dollars and then grant more out the next year. That's fabulous. And that way you have coalition members investing their kind of in-kind resources of their social media people <laughs> and their network to, to bring money in for the entire coalition. Exactly. Yeah, it definitely on social media helps us expand that reach and get more buy-in from the grantees as well. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Do you have anything else you want to add about the, the nine habits or how you've utilized it in the past? Have you ever used any of the worksheets in, in the planning meeting, Christy? I didn't ask you that to begin with. Or Yes, we've used them in uh, our steering committee meetings. I definitely use it by just looking at it and getting refreshers every once in a while before leadership meetings or planning meetings. I also use it, I facilitate a leading effective coalitions community of practice kind of in the Rocky Mountain region. And so I use it for that as well to get people just discussing how to run effective coalitions. Okay, so um, that's a great example of, of diversified resources and how Colorado has made a tax checkoff on, um, on their state tax forms. Um, what do you guys think about that? Has anybody else done something like that? or other examples of kind of innovative resources that you've been able to tap into? Is this something that you think you could do in your state? Remember, you have to take yourself off mute or you can feel free to type in the chat box as well. You know, we hear um, that lack of resources is, is such an issue um, and, and certainly is. I mean, everybody wishes that they had more resources. Trying to figure out how to get resources um, is definitely uh, a struggle. And I like, Katie, that you asked um, about the competition issue. Um, how people felt about, you know, maybe potentially taking money away from folks that would be contributing to other organizations. Yeah, um, I think, to be honest, that's why I love that this is one of the habits is because it's really hard to talk about money in your family, in your marriage, <laughs> in a coalition. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think having the conversation sometimes, maybe even before you have a lot of resources, yeah. can, can set the stage for when they do come. Exactly, because I think um, talking about how you're going to use them if they do come is really important because uh, sometimes money changes everything and that can be for the good or sometimes that cannot be so good. So Karen, I want to just mention something and there is a question in the chat we can talk about, but 
I want to, for those of you who might have remembered the nine habits several years ago when they were first published, um, the, this habit name has changed. So it used to be diversified funding and now it's diversified resources. And that was a, for a very specific reason because we wanted people to think beyond just money. We know that money is important, it's, you know, but it's also the resources that different partners can bring to the table. You can get a heck of a lot done with different resources being brought to the table by different partners without money being exchanged. And so we wanted to bring that concept and aspect into the nine habits this time around. Um, just so if you were paying attention, you might see there's a difference there in the title of that habit. Um, but there is a question here about our other states, coalitions, independent nonprofits, how are they able to receive money logistically? Which is a good question. There are a few states who do have and, and um, tribes or territories who do have independent um, 501c3 type organizations that could receive funding. It's not a lot, but there are some. Um, and then others have a fiscal agent. Maybe they're not the, maybe it's not the coalition itself, but other organization who could potentially receive funding as well um, on behalf of the coalition that might be able to support the work of the coalition. So we see it in lots of different ways. Yeah, like for that example, like a foundation. A foundation may receive money from the health department and they are then responsible for kind of the administrative functions of, of the coalition. Any other examples before we move on or any other questions? Oh, I like um, Nikki, thanks for, um, from Montana, thanks for your, your note here about um, coalition support is noted as a stipulation in the um, MCCCP grant requirements. Um, that's, that's awesome. Do you want to say a couple more things about that, Nikki, how that's worked for you? I don't know if you're at a place where you can unmute. Maybe you're not. <laughs> okay. So there's lots of creative ways. And I think, again, having conversations about these different ways with your leadership group, with your work groups, um, there are, um, you'd be surprised at how many, um, how many creative things that you can come up with. So again, having the conversation and then saying, if we do get the money, what are we gonna do with it is really important. Okay, I'm gonna move us along to um, habit number four here is dedicated staff. We have Angela, who I think I even saw on the call here, um, Angela McFall from, um, from Michigan. And um, Angela is going to talk about how they've dealt with habit number four in Michigan. Thank you so much for joining us today, Angela. I appreciate you taking the time um, to talk about the Michigan Cancer Consortium and how you all have used the nine habits in your daily practice. And I just thought maybe you could share a little bit about the habit of dedicated staff and how important that was for your group. The Michigan Cancer Consortium, we've had dedicated staff for our committees and work groups in place for a vast majority of the 20 years that we have been around as a coalition. And we feel that that's really helped with the sustainability of our coalition. The MCC members are volunteers and in many cases are professionals, busy professionals with full-time jobs. So having dedicated staff liaisons that can work closely with the MCC board of directors and the chairs of the work groups and committees provide standardization and consistency in our coalition. That's great. For your consortium, what does your staff look like? Or how have you guys been structured? We're structured in that we don't have a full-time staff person that works okay. on cancer. We have a variety of staff from different programs. Okay. So we work closely with the breast and cervical colorectal programs. We do have comp cancer staff, but they're not all funded by comp cancer dollars. We have a variety of staff that work on a variety of the coalitions. We have 10 coalition work groups and committees. So we have 10 different, well, I think we have eight staff liaisons that work with those groups. Um, so they come from colorectal, breast and cervical. Oh, that's interesting. So you kind of piece people together as opposed to having one full time. Correct. 
Sure. So, um, Angela, you guys are the people that are on the staff there in Michigan are part of are they health department staff? They are health department okay. staff as well as um, we have contractors and consultants from and staff that we work very closely with. They actually sit with us in our department from the Michigan Public Health Institute. Oh, interesting. That's great. And what kind of flex, does that afford some sort of flexibility? I mean, did you make that in that decision intentionally to have some contractors? I wasn't here when they made that decision. Okay. So I'm sure. Not sure. But I think that that's the reason that this decision was made. Um, it's not just our cancer program that works with Michigan Public Health Institute. It's the, our, almost our entire division, which is tobacco, cardiovascular health, diabetes, stroke, that sort of thing. So we nice. all work as a department of health and human services. What I find interesting is that you guys have kind of diversified your staff so that it's not all on one person. It's like um, work groups are different people's responsibilities and you have one person who's kind of, um, which is you, kind of herding the cat, so to speak, and, and keeping everybody right. on the same page and overseeing it. Yeah, definitely. I don't know that one person could do all of the work that is required with our coalition. Yeah. It's a large coalition and a lot of committees and work groups. So, well, do you have um, advice for other coalitions? You know that who are thinking about how to dedicate staff to this. Is this a a model you would suggest replicating, where you have um, a little piece of several people's time? Absolutely, I okay. think that I think it allows each individual staff liaison to have something that's theirs that they own to work on with the co with the chairs of the work groups. But I also think that it allows diversity in what they do, but it's a portion of what they do. We try to make it as closely related to what they do for the rest of their job. I think what it speaks to also is a, a great sense of collaboration for your health department, to be honest, to be able to work with these different departments, um, leadership, to have a little piece of different folks staff time. I mean, that in and of itself takes its own set of skills and coordination. So I think it sounds like it's a, a group effort, which I love. Tell me, as far as just the guide overall, Angela, are there, have you ever used the, the Nine Habits Guide worksheets or any part of it in a meeting, or is it something that you just use for yourself personally as a reference? I just use it for myself personally as a reference. I have been in the Comp Cancer Section since 2010, and when I came in, they were already implementing a good majority of the Nine Habits, so I don't, have not personally used yeah. them in meetings or anything, but I use them for myself as a reference. It, it's helpful to have a guide to go back to and figure out if you guys are on track. Exactly. Well, this has been really helpful, and I appreciate you sharing about um, dedicated staff and that habit, and thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Thank you so much, Angela, for, for that. We appreciate it. And Katie for doing these recordings. They were really helpful. And, I, and everyone has asked about, can you get the slides? And one of the reasons why we built the recordings in is so that you could use them yourselves and, and with others later on. So absolutely. Um, so any thoughts about that? Um, any other ways, creative ways, innovative ways that you've been able to find staff to help support the coalition. And I think you have to maybe um, click on yourself a couple times to unmute yourself. Start off with everybody unmuted, so you have to click a couple times. That's a good reminder, Leslie. I'll watch and type in here if you're trying to get yourself off mute and you're not able to, and we'll see if Todd can help us. So um, I think Michigan uh, has done, that's a great example of thinking about staff support, not just the comprehensive cancer control staff, but the other parts of the health department who can help with tobacco control, breast and cervical cancer, um, immunization. And so I know many of you um, and other states are doing the same thing. Any other examples of, um, of using different types of staffing to help support coalition? Well, I know in some places in the past, a partner has actually dedicated part of a person's time 
um, to helping to support the coalition. So that's, that's one um, helpful thing that can be done. Any other thoughts? You can put it in chat or come off mute. I had somebody, someone message me here saying that they try to utilize some of their university faculty. And, and that makes sense to me because you can oftentimes quote, have a buy a certain portion of, of someone's time as they piece together their own funding. Um, and I, and specifically this person saying for evaluation that they utilize someone from the local university for the evaluation piece because they couldn't afford an entire person. <laughs> they just need yeah. a little piece. You know, and I think sometimes this gets hard, right, in health departments because there's hiring freezes. Yeah. And, um, and so it's, it's hard. So again, trying to think creatively, how can we deal with that? So we've seen some folks um, use um, uh, interns um, from master degree programs okay. that um, have interns, you know, the uh, develop an internship. And it can be just even for things like doing a survey or for doing some recruitment of um, members or writing up, you know, guides or whatever. So I love a good intern. <laughs> yeah. So intern is really good. And, and then also when you have those um, kind of longer term issues with hiring freezes, you know, being able to talk to one of your partners and, and again, use somebody maybe for just even a part-time thing um, just for even a period of time. Again, though, this flips back to kind of the roles and responsibilities. So important if you do that to be very clear about what, what you're asking them to do for how long, how many hours you expect um, per week or per month. Um, so there's no confusion about um, what they're doing and what you're asking them to do. Well, thanks, thanks, Karen and Katie. I think we'll go ahead and move on to talk about how to use the nine habits, how to leverage them. Um, so, and actually, Karen's talked about this a lot, and, and so did Shante, which was perfect setup for this. Um, there are lots of different ways that you can use the nine habits. Um, you can talk about them during, as, as Shante was saying, they did a survey of the steering committee and then talked about them during a retreat with the steering committee and that was helpful. So that's one way to use it. We've seen it be used during work group meetings um, to help a particular work group. Maybe if they're floundering a little bit or not exactly sure what direction to go to actually use the nine habits to take that assessment um, to answer those questions as a group. And there is a lot of value in doing it as a group you know, we always have people sort of think about the answer to the question and uh, kind of grade themselves um, and quietly to themselves and then share it with everybody. And the discussion comes out when people start talking about what, how did you rate yourself or how did you rate us as a coalition? And talking about the differences between the ratings is really informative as well. Um, so that's, that's one thing to think about, about how to use it. Um, you can um, use it with the full coalition. We've seen that happen as well um, at, at you know, a survey and then having the results at the meeting. You can give a presentation on the nine habits at a full coalition meeting and have a full group discussion about it. So lots of different ways to leverage them and to use them. And one other thing I would say is that you can use this with any kind of coalition. We've seen it used with immunization coalitions, with other types of coalitions as well. So it works for a lot of different, uh, different types of coalitions. So the next thing we want to talk about is using the guide. Um, and hopefully, uh, if you hadn't looked at it before today, um, Katie put up the link. You can take a look at it. You can um, see that it has different sections in the guide. Um, there's a little bit of background definitions up front for, for each of the habit, tells you what you need to know about the habit. Then there's a section that's called making it a habit and it tells you sort of how to begin to use that concept with your coalition. Um, there are the assessment questions or the survey, the discussion questions that we've been talking about. And also at least one example from a state, tribe, or territory um, comprehensive cancer control coalitions that shows how they have used that habit and applied it themselves. 
And a lot of times there's a tool that you can, uh, or a website or some kind of a link that you can click on in the guide um, and take a look at that from that coalition. The other thing is um, a, lot of the, a lot of the sections have a tool that's built into the guide, but you can click on link a bit.ly within the, within the guide and go to that tool itself and download it for your own use. So when you, when you go to the, that um, link, you'll find that you can get both a Word file and also a PDF of each of the tools that are in the guide, which is something new that we have this time that we think is really helpful that we have not had before. Um, so there are lots of examples, lots of tools, lots of different things that you can use. So the next um, thing that we wanna, we wanna talk about is um, created an action plan. So as you work through the nine habits guide or as you're working on one habit, maybe you've decided you really need to focus on clear roles and accountability. When you look at that habit and you go to that section, you'll see the examples, you'll see some tools. Um, you'll also see a link that takes you into the end of the document that um, kind of breaks out how to make it a habit for each of these things. So you'll see that at the end of the guide, um, it helps you think through what would be my action? You know, what is the issue that we're dealing with here with this habit? What's the change that we've talked about making? How are we gonna make that change? By when, who can be involved? So there's a little bit of a action planning piece built into the guide itself at the end, but just, and again, thinking through it, review the habit or all of the habits, um, do those questions. And again, that discussion of the ratings as a group is really helpful because it helps you unearth some issues that you might not have thought about before. Um, and then agreeing on some action steps. And then the last bullet here is really important, which is to create a plan to put the actions into practice. So this is um, hopefully something, and you'll see this in the beginning of the guide, if you think about these nine habits as things that you do on a regular basis, it's the part of the business of running the coalition. You really have to think about how to put them into action. So it's not enough just to do the assessment and then let it sit. You actually need to have a discussion, make some decisions together about changes you can make, even if they're small, um, and then build them into your regular practice as a coalition. So that putting the plan into action or into practice is really important. And then um, if you want, you know, hopefully you've been able to take a look at this guide. If you have any questions about the guide, you're more than welcome to contact Karen or myself. Um, and, uh, and also, of course, any of the Comprehensive Cancer Control National Partners, you can contact, but we're happy to answer any questions that you might have um, to get more information. So before I pass it off to you, Katie, I want to ask if anybody has any questions or um, other examples that you want to put into the chat about how you've been able to, um, to put the habits into use. Any other ideas that we haven't talked about yet? And Todd, if you wouldn't mind pulling up the poll maybe while we're waiting for um, folks to come off mute, there's just a couple questions we'd love for you to answer um, as we're closing things out. But uh, thanks so much. Um, Karen and Leslie, um, as folks, what's the best way? You mentioned people getting in touch with you. Would you mind, um, how, how would the best way for them to get in touch with you if they have more questions about the guide? Do you want to um, just put one of your emails? Yeah, we can put our, how about we put our email in the chat that would and be great. if anybody has questions and phone. Absolutely. That's great. Um, so, so is it okay if I uh, chat a little bit, Leslie, or did you have? Yeah. Okay. No, that's it. If you have questions, just please put them in the chat and we'll try to answer them as we yes. go along. Absolutely. So maybe you watch the chat while I, I, I do a little chatting. Um, but I, I just wanted to give a shout out, um, you know, Karen and Leslie have spearheaded this work with the creation of the guide and they worked closely with, with what's called the Comprehensive Cancer Control National Partnership. There are about 19 organizations that are national cancer control organizations that meet twice a year. And, and really what we do at those meetings is try to figure out how to help you all, how to, um, how to help cancer coalitions that are doing the hard work on the front lines. And 
that was the impetus of this guide over 15 years ago and the impetus for its revision again. So uh, I wanna encourage you, um, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, Karen, um, visit the National Partner website. Um, and I think it's on the very last slide. Visit the National Partner website, look at the organizations that are there. Um, we really meet to help you. So if you, if you have specific needs that you feel like your coalition has, um, I, I think there's a couple ways that you could um, look for help. Obviously, um, try some things out if you feel like you're ready to do that through the, through the guide. But also some of the organizations and the national partners um, might be able to, to help you as well, to have a conference call or um, think about trying to get a meeting together. And there's a couple ways that you can seek that kind of help. I know that for those of you on the phone that are staff of comprehensive cancer control programs around the country, um, the comprehensive cancer control programs have a channel called KIC, the Cancer Information Channel. And you can submit technical assistance needs and questions actually into that KIC portal. So if you're not familiar with that portal or you don't know how to use it as a staff member there at the state program, ask your program consultant, um, your CDC program consultant. I know that they would be happy to, to point you there. Uh, there we're, we're looking to try to centralize all our technical assistance needs. And so that's one way that they're gonna do it. Um, also feel free to reach out as, as we mentioned in the chat to myself, you all obviously have um, an email, but um, we can connect you to folks who might be able to help you. That's what the national partners are all about. Um, I will tell you that this is the last of our, our ACS Comp Cancer webinars for this fall, but we've got lots of good things happening in the spring and summer next year. One thing I wanted to share with you is the national partnership is also planning a, um, a workshop that will be in June of 2020. It's pretty specific. It's for those of you that are working on how to help your survivors with nutrition and physical activity. And so we're gonna have a very targeted workshop um, that looks around making an action plan for coalitions to work with survivors in their state, tribal territory um, around nutrition and physical activity needs. So be watching your inbox because we'll put out an application for state teams to come to that. We're hoping to host um, 10 or 11 teams in Atlanta for that workshop in June 2020. So that's, again, something that all these national organizations like NCI, ACS, GW, um, folks like Strategic Health, um, the American College of Surgeons, I could go on and on, um, the cancer support community, we all get together and um, try to figure out how we can offer technical assistance. And so that's one of the things we're going to do um, coming in June 2020. So thank you so much, um, Karen and Leslie, for, for being on the call and for being willing to, to put some, um, some meat on the bones of this guide. The guide's been um, around for a long time and these updates are exciting. Um, do you have any closing thoughts for us before we tell everyone goodbye? No, I, I see Leslie, you just um, answered somebody's question about involving um, uh, state legislatures. Um, and and so you can read that um but thank you everybody and keep on fighting the good fight this is hard work yes, and mm -hmm. um and so we know and, and it's very common for coalitions to have up times and things are going well and then and have down times um so just hang in there and um and those up times if, if things aren't going well hang in there and those up times will will come back <laughs> Thanks. Kim. Yeah, and thanks everybody for joining today. It was a great number of people. Good to see your names and faces. Yeah. And, um, and we all learn, you know, Karen and I is updating this guide. We learned as much from you all as, as um, anybody else. And so I uh, felt like we learned more than we taught. So thank you so much <laughs> for all your experience and, and your expertise. That's really what's in this guide is your experience. So thank you everybody who contributed and Thanks for your involvement today. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, guys. And if there's any questions that were left unaddressed, we'll make sure that you get answers to those from Karen and Leslie um, and our other partners. So thanks, everybody, for joining us today. All right. Have a great rest of your week. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.